Welcome everybody to today's webinar, Legal Accounting Webinar Series, Trust Accounting. Presenting today we have Erica Bursler, Cosmolex Director of Strategic Communications. With that, I will hand the presentation over to Erica. Awesome. Thank you so much. So yes, today's topic is with Trust Accounting. So our learning objectives for today's webinar is getting a little bit into the basics. What is trust accounting? Uh, the top 10 pitfalls that can occur. And also going within records. Um, when you're dealing with trust accounting, having proper reporting uh, and records is of the utmost importance, even more so than any other area of uh, accounting. So we're going to make sure to talk about that. And lastly is how can technology help? Um, compliance is always a big worry when dealing with trust accounting, but tools can really help take that uh, fear, worry, and headache away. Instead of having to think about every single cent, allow technology to help you to remain compliant overall. So um, this is everything that we'll be covering and we'll go ahead and get started. So I always like to show this image, especially with trust accounting, because I bet sometimes it might feel this way. Um, hopefully your trust records don't look this way, but it may feel like overwhelming. There's a lot going on. There's so many different clients and balances. How do I keep it all straight? Now, if you don't feel this way, that's excellent. Um, you're in the minority, unfortunately. But the purpose of uh, today's webinar is so you don't feel like this. Uh, a way to gain a bit of control so that you're not, while it's good to worry a bit because it, it's important to be on top of your records and always know what's going on, you don't want it to just take over your whole practice. Um, so that's really the purpose of, and hopefully will be accomplished by the end of today's webinar. So before we get into our pitfalls, let's quickly review the typical needs of law firms, uh, even with a small or solo firm, all different type of law firms. You have three components um, in terms of the tools that you may be using. Uh, law practice management system. That's more so for your calendaring, your task tracking, your emails, and your documents, it's kind of your daily activities. Also a legal billing system, of course, that's your time and expense tracking, your invoicing, your collections, and I'm sure many of you have tools for both. But lastly is a law firm accounting system, and that's where we're gonna go into a little bit more detail today. So I feel a lot of law firms kind of neglect accounting. Um, don't think of it as much as billing and practice management, and it is probably the most crucial part of your law firm. Um, not only are you're an attorney, you're running a business as well. So accounting in general is just a part of that package, but trust accounting comes with being an attorney as well. That's just, um, some states you don't have to have a trust account, most states you do. And when you do, in most states, those funds have to go through trust as well. So it's an active account. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about law firm accounting system. What do I mean by that? And, and what are the details? So it breaks down into three components when we talk about legal or law firm accounting. You have business accounting. So like I said, uh, at the end of the day, you're running a business, so you're going to have to worry about things like other companies do, uh, you know, booking your income and expenses, producing your profit and loss and balance sheet, uh, pretty standard uh, across most businesses, but that's only one of the three components. Uh, the second component is matter cost and income accounting. How do you uh, book those matter costs uh, in terms of reimbursement? Paying out of pocket, but it needs to be billed to your client. And then the income when it comes in. How is your income collected? How is that allocated and recorded on your general ledger? It's unique for law firms. And the last piece, which kind of falls into what we're talking about today, is the fee advances and retainer accounting. So whenever, um, this is actually very specific to law firms dealing with uh, either fee or cost advances up front or trust retainers as well. And there's an additional um, matter specific tracking that needs to take place, which no other business needs with. Uh, so the fact that these specific requirements are needed in law firms, that's why a lot of the tools and, and solutions and processes that are used for other businesses don't work for law firms. So like I said, we are going to go to the basics a little bit, um, let's talk about what is trust accounting. That is the bookkeeping of trust accounts in accordance to state requirements. It is important to note that last part, state requirements. Every state is different 
in terms of compliance. Now, of course, there's the federal level of compliance, uh, but for instance, some states require all funds, like all invoice payments, to funnel through for trust first. That's not the case for every state, but in some states it's an absolute requirement. So you need to be aware of what your state requirements are, and it is the law firm's responsibility at the end of the day to make sure they're educated on the specific uh, state requirements. You also don't want to assume that your bookkeeper or accountant knows what these requirements are. Uh, reason being is there are many bookkeepers and accountants that are very, very knowledgeable in accounting, but maybe not so much in legal accounting. So with whoever you work with for your bookkeeping or accounting functions, you want to make sure that they are well aware of legal accounting, trust accounting, and the specific compliance within that. Don't assume that they will know it regardless. So we'll talk about the type of funds in trust and also those that don't belong in trust. So first, as to what typically is in the trust account. It can be settlement funds. Uh, if you're dealing with personal injury cases or even real estate settlements, which is typically escrow, uh, those are often always in trust. Um, that's probably the highest trust activity for those types of uh, practices. Unearned income, which is any sort of fee or cost advance or retainers, those, of course, can go in the trust account. And if you're ever not sure, like if you're in one of those states where there's flexibility and you're not sure if this money should go in trust, we always say, better safe than sorry, put it in the trust account and earn it from there. Um, that will ensure that no matter what, you're remaining compliant. Judgment funds, which goes with the personal injury as well, and third-party funds. That is if you are perhaps a fiduciary in a certain situation and you're taking on funds for somebody else. Of course, if you're willing to take on that responsibility for those funds, absolutely that can be in your trust account. Types of funds not in trust. Few examples here. Any personal funds. Now, in some states you're allowed a small buffer of operating funds to cover wire fees and bank fees, et cetera. So the amount of that buffer varies by state. Some states don't allow it at all. So again, beware of your local requirements. But in general, anything that is operating funds should not be within the trust account. Because if it is, you need to be basically acting like it's another ledger. And you don't want to get confused with those funds within your actual trust funds. Earned income, when anything is earned, it should be taken out of the trust account as soon as possible. Don't wait, because then again, it will get confusing. If your billing system has those invoices as being paid, and perhaps your accounting system or your bank has those funds still there, your reconciliations are not going to match. Um, you're going to be actually a little deceived as to the available balance for that matter, and it's going to be a lot harder to discern what is the client's money and what is actually earned. So do not keep anything that's earned for the firm in the trust account uh, more than a couple of days. Payroll, that's an example of an office expense. Anything dealing with um, overhead or uh, specific office expenses should have nothing to do at all with the trust account. Uh, none of those trust funds should ever be used for business or personal use. And wherever you're not the fiduciary trustee. When you're taking on uh, trust funds, as I'm sure you all know, you're taking on an added bit of responsibility. Uh, in fact, states where it's an option, attorneys usually choose not to handle a trust account because there is responsibility that comes with that if there's an option. But if there's no option, obviously, and everything has to go through uh, the trust account itself, only accept funds that you are willing to take the responsibility for. This is not the situation where, you know, uh, John Smith down the street says, hey, uh, I want to, can you hold this money for me? I know you're really good at holding trust funds. Can you hold it for me? should not be that type of situation. Um, you are taking on the responsibility of those funds if it's in your trust account. And the responsibility falls on the firm. This is one thing um, I learned about the other day, but keep in mind, obviously, if you're a solo attorney, you and the firm is kind of one and the same. But keep in mind, too, if you're in a partnership, if there's mul multiple attorneys in the firm, that responsibility falls on the firm. 
So if something happens with yourself or one of the other attorneys and how they're treating the trust account, that reflects directly on the firm in terms of compliance. So keep that in mind always. All right, so current trust accounting tools. Um, what law firms are typically using to manage their trust account? Uh, first is manual, which are, that could be written ledgers, you know, a ledger book, could be Excel spreadsheets, still very common. Um, the one main issue with this is the reason why attorneys love it. It's very flexible and it's something you can really do however you wish, which is exactly why it cannot be used for trust accounting. Uh, any tools for trust accounting should be inflexible, uh, should actually be um, very standardized, uh, kind of forcing you to do what you need to do and not allow you to kind of fudge whatever numbers you want. Next is generic accounting software. So this could be uh, programs like QuickBooks or Quicken or Xero or something like that, um, which are made for all different types of businesses. You want to be very wary of this because it's meant for general businesses. The legal accounting specifics, which is uh, including trust accounting, those programs are not built for that type of functionality. Not to say you can't use those tools, but there's gonna be a lot that you need to be aware of and the time investment and the risk of non-compliance is much higher. And then lastly is legal specialized accounting software. Um, I always encourage law firms that are dealing with um, obviously business account, but especially with the trust account to really consider legal specialized tools because there's a lot of safeguards, there's a lot of automation that can take place when a tool is specifically designed for attorneys and legal accounting. And I'll give you a few examples of that later. So overall, believe it or not, um, trust accounting is, is kind of easy for a few reasons. And don't worry, we will talk about how it's difficult as well. But there are a lot of ways it's super simple because of these few points here. You're not having to worry about a lot of the things you need to worry about with an operating account. Uh, for instance, there's no profit or loss with trust accounting. There's no depreciation or amortization of the different funds in there. There's no interest accumulation. Even if you have an IOLTA account, that interest comes in and it goes right out. It's not accumulating over time. There's no tax accounting specific for a trust account. Um, yes, your trust account is a portion of your business. It is a liability to your firm, so it will be a balance sheet item, but it's not requiring its own individual accounting. And then you're not having to deal with um, account management fees or bank fees. Now, Remember before I mentioned that some states allow you to have a little bit of buffer personal funds to cover wire fees and bank fees, et cetera. That shouldn't be the case. I understand why it's allowed, but it shouldn't be allowed. All right, so I was mentioning about the bank fees. Um, you want to be aware of the bank that you're dealing with for your trust account. Any bank, not all banks do, but any bank could say, hey, we handle trust accounts. That doesn't mean they're handling them properly. What should happen is if you ever have a wire fee or um, a bank charge or anything like that, it should never come out of your trust account. It should come out of a linked operating account. And that's just trust compliance. Now, you in a way can't fault the bank because they're not specializing in trust accounting. They're just offering that type of account. But you need to be aware of this. If your bank is taking any sort of fees out of your trust account, that is commingling. That is taking from your client's money and it's gonna make it really hard to reconcile as well at the end of the month. So if you have that situation, I do encourage that you speak with your bank and say to them, listen, I don't want these fees coming out of my trust account. They should only come out of an operating account. Can you set that up for me? And if they say yes, great. If they say no, then you need to determine if you wanna still work with that bank. So I always like to bring that point up because it is uh, standard compliance to not have those fees come out of the trust account. So that explains why it's easy, but it's also a little bit complicated, uh, but it's not too bad. It's really just all about tracking. Um, the three biggest items are you have to track funds for each and every matter. 
Um, every single case that you have, you need to have a running ledger for each one of those, money in, money out, and a balance for each one of your cases. Tools can help a lot with that. Um, if you're using a generic tool that doesn't force that, I could see how it can be challenging, but you have to hold you and your staff accountable to making sure every transaction is matter-based. You have to reconcile your books monthly. Um, I did talk before a little bit about reconciliation, and the point is to catch mistakes. The reason why it's a requirement for trust accounting as opposed to an operating account, which it's good to do, but it's not a requirement, is because this is not yet your money. It is your client's funds, possibly third-party funds, and if a mistake takes place, it needs to be caught and rectified as soon as possible. Those mistakes could be with the um, bank. I have heard of double withdrawals and double deposits. It happens, and until you reconcile and let the bank know, sometimes they don't even realize it. So that itself could be a big issue for your trust account if not caught, but also there can be errors in-house. You can transpose a couple numbers. Uh, I actually had a customer we spoke to the other day that said, you know what, I was supposed to cut a check for $549 and I did it for $594. And the only way she realized she did something wrong is that she was reconciling and the numbers didn't match. So otherwise that would have gone on for who knows how long. So you have to reconcile your books monthly and you have to maintain an audit trail. Uh, really for the same reasons. When you're dealing with your client's money, you need to account for every action that takes place on that account and have a good record for it. Um, let's say you accidentally overdraft. We'll talk a little bit about overdrafts and how to avoid them completely, but if you ever did overdraft, you need good record of it because if somebody calls you up and says you're going to get audited today, if anybody asks questions about your account, they're going to look at your reports and your records and they'll see an overdraft, but if you have good records and understanding as to why that is, that's a big help. Not to say it will completely, you know, get rid of the problem, but in any situation where something might occur, good records can always help in explaining the issue. All right, so what are the main uh, things that go wrong when dealing with a trust account? So here we have, uh, these are all the items that we're gonna be covering today uh, in detail with uh, specific to trust accounting, of course, and this is common. You might recognize some items here that relate to you. You may say, oh, some of these don't, some of them do. The point is to familiarize yourself with all of the things that can go wrong and uh, kind of identify within your practice if there's anything that can be improved. So let's go through uh, the different items on this list. Our first item is lack of trust-specific knowledge and rules. And some of these I touched upon kind of in the introduction, and I'll just uh, kind of add on to that. As I mentioned, each state has its own compliance guidelines and also audit programs. Um, for instance, we're in the state of New Jersey, there's a random audit program where they literally look through a bunch of phone numbers, pick one, call them up and say, in two weeks, I'm gonna be at your door to audit you. Some of you may be thinking, oh, I'm glad I'm not in that, mine's not like that. It's if something happens in the bank account, uh, if I have a red flag, then I get audited. Um, some it's every three years you get audited. So either way, you need to be aware of what your um, specific rules are in terms of audits, but also don't think that because you only get audited if there's an issue that you should not maintain clean trust accounts. Don't make it so when that time comes, you're having to worry about this issue because trust accounting, uh, proper trust accounting is a form of prevention. It's like um, insurance. So you need to act like you will be audited tomorrow. Just like, you know, you have medical insurance, you have car insurance, just in case something happens tomorrow. It should be the same exact way with your trust account. Regardless as to whether you can get audited every day, every five years, you want to be aware of that, but it should by no means dictate how strict and compliant you are with your books. Every single day you should be handling things uh, in compliance to your state and also, of course, federal guidelines as well. You cannot use the excuse of, I didn't know. And it's unfortunate that most law programs, uh, if, I mean, vast majority, do not teach anything about trust accounting. And it's really unfortunate because it is a primary part of running a law firm 
and it's something that is so um, compliance related and strict in a way that you want attorneys to be aware of what's the situation you know especially if you you know take your bar or, or go to school in a certain state to at least know the state requirements should be the minimum uh, so that's why I like doing these types of webinars because I do know that unfortunately the education of trust accounting is so low but at the end of the day that does fall on the law firm itself manual systems so um, I did mention before this could be either on a manual ledger which is still very common or even in Excel and it is two things very time-consuming uh, because if you find an error or something needs to be fixed recreating those records would be a nightmare uh, but also very prone to errors anytime you're handwriting something you're increasing the risk of um, having an issue because most people with manual systems are not really reconciling it's more like I'm aware of what's in my bank, I know what's on my ledger, and I take a look every month and they look good. There's nothing forcing them to you know, check off items. They're kind of uh, going based off of their own um, accountability for that. So that's one part. Um, I did mention errors, of course, are common. Uh, they can be really hard to fix. You can basically take hours to track down uh, you know a few dollar discrepancy to kind of figure out what happened there and it could easily just be uh, a misentry or a miswriting of a number and this goes for your checks and deposit slips as well you should print whenever possible reason being is um, not only is it more professional more legible uh, but also uh, of course like I said when you handwrite you run the risk of mixing up those numbers but also if you have a <clears throat> billing system, for instance, or accounting system, or wherever you might be tracking those items, let's say I enter a transaction um, where I'm doing my trust accounting in, my, in a system for $500, and then I handwrite the check for $400 because I made a mistake. I thought it was a different number, and I made the, the wrong number there. Then there's going to be issue when I go ahead and reconcile. Even worse, if it was a higher number, I might have overdrafted on that ledger. So if you can print your checks from wherever you're entering those transactions, that's the best way to go. Now, if you're using a general accounting system, which kind of falls into a similar category, like I said, they're not built for law firms, so you need to make sure they're set up properly. Um, since those types of tools are not designed for legal practices, you really need to be extra vigilant and evaluate carefully. You need to be aware of what the system does, what it doesn't do, if there's workarounds, how to do them, if there's lacking reports, how to possibly build those reports, but that responsibility again falls on you and if you have other staff members you need to make sure that they're well aware of these um, maybe workarounds or whatnot as well all right so our third item is trust funds get commingled so there are two types of commingling one is losing track of client balances in the trust account that's with no separate ledgers I have still talked with <laughs> law firms, and I can't even believe this, where I say, all right, this is your, your trust balance, do you know who has what? And they say, no. Unacceptable with trust accounting. You absolutely have to know at any given moment, moment what the balance is for each matter in, related, in relation to trust funds. It's just completely unacceptable to not know that number. So that's, um, that's a requirement. So when you lose track of those balances, of course, you're kind of the money's all muddled together. You don't know who is what, you don't know what's available for who, so it's literally commingled together. You have a whole uh, bank balance that's kind of a question mark, not knowing what belongs to who. And then the second form is mixing client funds with your own funds. Like I said, if you should not have, if you can help it, should not have any personal funds in the trust account because that too you can lose track of. Let's say you have $300 of personal funds and then some wire fees start coming out and now you probably have about 250 in personal funds but you're kind of losing track of that so you're not sure of the remaining what is actual trust funds and what's personal funds that too commingling uh, so you can keep different trust funds in one bank account okay so when I'm talking about commingling I'm not saying you need to have a separate bank account for each client some 
firms do depending on the type of work that you do. So if you have large sums of money that may sit for a while, you may choose to have separate trust accounts. It's not required, but some do it just for cleaner bookkeeping. But if you have kind of a highly active trust account, all that money can be in one trust account. That's not a problem. Um, but they need to be separated out in your books. In your own records, you need to know who has what. Our fourth item is trust ledger overdraft. So this is kind of part of the commingling part as well. This is a number one rule. I feel like I have like five number one rules for trust, but this is one of them. Um, you cannot overdraft on a trust ledger. It is complete non-compliance, no question about it. And it's usually not done purposely. It's usually just negligence. You have a $2,000 check to cut. It's a legitimate uh, legitimate disbursement, you write that check, go ahead and, and send that out, and then if you're reconciling, you might catch it, if you're not, you might not, um, but in your reports, you realize, I only had $1,000 for this person, and I cut a $2,000 check. I technically, technically took $1,000 from somebody else. Now what do I do? So you want to avoid that situation completely, because it's hard to locate, especially if your system is kind of a uh, either manual or kind of all over the place or not safeguarded, it can be hard to find. But if you ever were to get audited or if you ever look at your reports, it'll be there like bright red in their eyes that you overdrafted and technically took funds from somebody else. So you want to make sure that, and this comes to the individual ledgers per matter, that's why it's so important to know how much funds you have for each person so that you avoid overdrafting. Um, and this is probably one of the main reasons where law firms get in trouble. And I know it sounds scary. You're thinking, well, that's totally easy to cut a check for more than I thought I should. But this is one of the examples where, where technology can really, really help. So I'll give you an example of that towards the end. Absence of safeguards. So this actually kind of blends the uh, overdraft and the commingling duplicate checks, all those things together. Um, software tools can help so much uh, in remaining compliant, but they need to be legal specific trust accounting tools. If you're using something generic or using a manual method, nothing's gonna prevent you from writing that larger check. Nothing's gonna prevent you from uh, having a duplicate check number. So it's important to know what can and cannot be done and think of whether you wanna take that responsibility on yourself in making sure those rules are followed every day, or have a system that kind of forces that. So this is usually a struggle um, because, like I said, the difference between trust accounting and any other accounting is there's rules. There's rules that have to be followed, um, and everybody knows how important it is to follow those rules because that is usually when law firms get in trouble. Mismanagement of third-party bills and liens. So for any of you that might be working in certain practice areas like personal injury or workman's, workers' comp or even probate, uh, there's a lot of different examples of this, but it is area-specific. So some of you this might not be um, relative for, but if you ever have a situation where um, during the case, you know, prior to settlement, you have bills coming in could be from doctors or hospital employers or whatever it may be. They're coming in and they're liens on the settlement, meaning when the case finally closes and the payment comes in, that judgment comes in, these people have to get paid. You're not paying them directly. It's coming out of the settlement, which is in the trust account. But it has to be tracked. Uh, reason being is, uh, as the attorney, you're responsible for, first off, making sure the settlement is um, accurate or it covers the costs at least because when you're negotiating that settlement you need to be aware we have X amount of costs uh, that have to be dispersed so then there'll be X or Y remaining for my client. Um, so that has to be taken into consideration and also these people have to get paid. It is the attorney's responsibility to make sure these people get paid out of if you lose track of these bills, uh, if you're not sure who is owed what, then of course there'll be an issue, either with the amount of the settlement or with the fact of somebody not getting paid um, for the work that they did, or uh, even worse, they all get paid and your client's not left with anything at the end because the settlement isn't really negotiated well. So 
couple things to think about if you're in those uh, areas. Most people track this in Excel, uh, or if you have uh, like a, a really specific personal injury type of tool, uh, perhaps you have a function for that. Um, but anything that deals with tracking of these bills uh, definitely needs to be um, stayed on top of if you're in that type of area. Our seventh item, uncleared funds not addressed. So I've talked already about reconciliation. One of the results of reconciliation is, um, let's say you close the month, everything looks good, great. You're, it's kind of natural to have uncleared items. Usually they're items that you may have cut a, a check yesterday and the month just closed or deposit takes a, a few days to clear. It's okay, it's, it's not saying you can't have uncleared items, but if something's uncleared this month, and then the next month, and then the next month, and then the next month, you need to be aware of that. Because if you cut a check, and let's say mail it to your client, two, three months pass, that check, that those funds are still in uh, your property. They're still in um, your fiduciary responsibility. So you need to make sure that it gets addressed. It is not the client or that third party's funds until they cash that check and it has cleared. Um, many people forget about this point. Uh, they say, oh, I have uncleared items, whatever. In a couple couple years, they discover I have X amount of dollars and uncleared items and I'll, I'll just you know put it to the side. I've actually talked with law firms who reconcile and say, Ignore those ones at the bottom. Those have been uncleared for like three years. That's not okay. That money has to go somewhere to someone. Um, some states have um, unclaimed funds process where you can send those. If for whatever reason the client or whoever is not getting back to you, you made X amount of attempts, you can have a process to um, submit those unclaimed funds. But again, know how your state is set up uh, in that regard because those funds are your responsibility until it clears on the other side. And reconciling each month will help you to discover that. So reconciliation in general, um, I've said it's always important, really any bank account you have, you should reconcile. It's like balancing a checkbook, it's making sure that there's no mistakes, that um, I'm aware of my available balances, but it is absolutely critical for the trust account because like I mentioned, these are your client's funds. So it is not optional, it is a requirement and it should be happening uh, monthly at least. And um, in terms of the reconciliation itself, like I said, it happens monthly. Uh, you also need to have proper reporting like a three-way reconciliation report, which I'll show you an example in a moment. That is the ability to compare your bank balance, your book balance, and all of the ledgers for that um, account as well. So all of your clients have all those balances. They should add up to the same amount that's uh, in your book and bank. All right, so our ninth item is separate billing and accounting systems. Now for most firms, the billing and trust are are interrelated, they cross over quite often. But believe it or not, um, in majority of cases, they're handled separately. You have maybe one system that handles your billing, another system that handles your accounting, um, and usually the trust accounting, believe it or not, is bridged between both. Uh, I know it's a very common scenario to have uh, the, the practice management software that has the billing and trust balances in it, but no trust accounting happens there. You know, the reconciliation doesn't happen there, the reporting doesn't happen there. That happens in another accounting software. So in a separate accounting software, you have those trust balances again, you're reconciling and doing the reporting. What if while reconciling there's a mistake? You spot that mistake. That has to be fixed there, and then somebody needs to make sure it's fixed in the other program. Because it's important to know the available balance for billing. If I discover in my accounting software, wait, this person doesn't have um, 3,000, they have 2,000. But my billing system still says 3,000, I'm gonna take that money out of trust without realizing it. So it's very important to have a unified record of trust and trust really bridges the gap between these two, the billing and accounting. They're so interrelated, they're so dependent on each other for all different type of um, functions that when they're separate, there's a lot of challenges that can uh, come from that. And one prime example is when you earn funds from trust, like when you're paying an invoice from trust, 
just think about this. You need to uh, debit the trust account, credit the operating account, the client balances in terms of trust balances, um, and of course billing balances have to be updated. The invoice has to be updated as paid or a balance reduction, and all the bank balances. Now in that explanation, there was a lot of balance and accounting information, but also billing information happening at the same time. So with just a simple act of paying an invoice from trust, there's a lot of activities that are kind of crossing this gap here on this bridge and could possibly fall through. So something to keep in mind, um, take a look at your setup and see if you're experiencing any of that. And our last item is lack of controls and data protection. So I I know that most law firms take their trust accounting pretty seriously. And um, in regards to permissions and controls, there is a, um, you should always have protection, of course. You want to make sure that um, everything is backed up, it's secure, it's accessible by only certain people, but you don't want to go to the extreme of having one computer in the corner of the office with no internet and nobody has a password but one person. You don't want to go to that extreme because a few things. One, if it's on one computer, something happens to that computer, your trust records are gone. Two, you don't want to give one person solo access unless it's you as the attorney because what if that person leaves? What if they change the password? Um, you know, what if they're not available and you need to access that information? You don't want to have um, any sole person having uh, access to that information unless it's you yourself as the attorney. And um, backups especially, um, a lot of people take um, backups from one computer, sometimes save it on the same computer. That is not a backup, that's a copy, but it is absolutely in no way disaster recovery. Uh, you need to have that elsewhere. Uh, best, in my opinion, is to have some sort of cloud backup, so that way you can access that wherever you are. You don't have to worry about losing a thumb drive or losing a CD or however you're backing up your data. Uh, you don't want something physical that you need to worry about. And with any tool you're using, especially if you're dealing with a trust accounting specific tool, there's permissions built in. So you can have users in that software and block them from certain things. You know, maybe you want them to see a certain trust account, not another one. Well, make sure you're using tools that allow that. There are tools that have that type of functionality. So maybe it's just a matter of being familiar with what's available, um, but by no means do you have to have the, the trust account software program notes literally locked up and segregated from anybody else working in the office. All right, we're going to talk about some trust account records. Uh, I did mention how important trust accounting, uh, or should say reporting, is to trust accounting. So here's a few reports. These are the seven main reports for a trust account. And I actually generated a copy of each from Cosmolex to give you a visual. So we'll go through each one of these right now. So first is the bank ledger. This is your bank activity, the money in and out of that bank account. So let's say this is a trust account. It will say the money in, money out, all the different transactions. It'll have checks, it'll have deposits, and it'll have a balance. Now, a few things important here. One is a running balance, so you'll be able to see if any at any point the bank was overdrafted, but also you do this per account. If you have more than one trust account, you need to do this for each and every trust account that you have. Receipts journal is half of the bank activity report. These are just your deposits. So sometimes it's very helpful and auditors may, may request this as well, to see just the money coming in because maybe they want to make sure that the deposits are uh, marked properly and they might compare records, uh, but definitely want the two halves, the cash receipts and also the cash disbursements. These are all the checks that went out of that trust account uh, for that particular period of time. The ledger card balance report. So this gives you the balance for each of the clients in your books. So I have separate clients over here, Tom Richmond, I have a matrimonial matter, uh, Joan Smith, I have a divorce matter, and so on. But the important thing here is notice it's cleared and uncleared. That's very important to know uh, because let's say you wrote a check for $100 12 months ago and maybe that check was lost in the mail like I was talking about before, your books will show the balance as zero. 
but there's still funds that have not cleared the bank. So here, for instance, I will have zero as my balance, but I need to be aware that 340 is kind of out there and we're not really sure what's going on. Same thing for each one of these. So you want to be able to know the balance of a matter, but also what of that is cleared and uncleared. Individual ledger card. I know this is a little, a little small, but basically what this is is a bank statement for your client. It is um, for that particular matter, money in, money out, checks, um, deposits, running balance. Remember I said if you overdraft on a ledger, that's going to be clear as day. Yes, this is where it will show up, but it is a, a basic essential report uh, to have the history of the trust accounting for a particular case. For reconciliation, I know I've talked about it a lot, so I won't get into any more detail, but um, I just can't stress how important it is. If there's one thing you're going to do for your trust account, reconciliation should be it. Uh, now, reconciliation is not just the reviewing, but the sign-off and the closing of your books every month. So you do need to fix those errors if you find them, and you shouldn't just be making adjustments. You shouldn't just say, oh, this is off by $300, let me make a $300 adjustment. No. You need to figure out what that $300 is, why that is a situation, and make sure it gets rectified. So again, it's about finding um, mistakes, fixing them as soon as possible, and then you need to have the proper reporting with that. So this is an example of a reconciliation report. Uh, this is showing, um, and I'll break it down here, what I have in my book, so my book ending balance. So it's basically saying this is reconciled, it's complete, everything matches, which is good. But here is my cleared deposits, cleared, uncleared uh, deposits, and uncleared payments. So I am well aware of what went through this month and what did not. This is where those uncleared items will stick out like a sore thumb to me. If I am printing this report uh, for, say, three months in a row and I take a look at it, I should see, I might see a pattern, and that pattern may be a problem. Um, another point I want to bring up is if you are having somebody else, a bookkeeper or an accountant, handle your trust account, my advice to you is at a minimum, as the attorney, you should require a copy of the reconciliation report every month. Uh, also, you open your bank statements. Whoever the head partner or attorney is in the firm should be opening up the bank statements to make sure everything is okay. Because I know, and I don't want to build mistrust in any law firms here, but I know of situations where, you know, paralegals or secretaries would open the bank statement themselves and kind of push under the rug that they cut a check to somebody they should not have. So you want to make sure you open those bank statements, just quickly review it, make sure everything looks good. And also, once they reconcile, they should provide this report to you. So you don't have to physically do the reconciliation yourself. You don't physically have to do the transactions yourself but you need to have that person produce the proper report so that you know that everything is being done properly. And the last piece is a three-way reconciliation report, which is a trust account specific report. Um, we have it in our software. It is not in a general accounting software. Um, anything specific to trust would have it, I would hope. But uh, this is comparing the book balance, what's in my records, the bank balance, which is what's at the bank, and all of my client ledgers, that will all add up to the same number. In our system, as long as you reconcile and close the month, this report will always match. But it is that proof to whoever's looking at your trust account to say, I'm doing everything properly. All right, so we're going to go down. See, I have the other reports here. So we're going to go down a ways and actually do a quick overview um, so that you can see how a legal specific trust accounting program can help. Um, again, this is not about what system you use. Uh, I'll be using Cosmolex for the de demonstration, but it's by no means saying that you can only use Cosmolex. It's basically pointing out that um, the pitfalls and then the challenges that we talked about today, technology can help with that. So if you're experiencing any of those issues, you might want to see about different tools and how they can help you to remain compliant. So the first example I want to show is, um, this is my matter list. So these are all of my cases, and that's extremely important, um, believe it or not. It sounds simple, but with whatever accounting software or software you're using for your trust account, it needs to have the concept of a matter. Everything needs to go around that one case, not a client, 
but the case, because your balances for a trust perspective should be related per case. You don't want to mix, let's say you're doing a family law case and a real estate case for one client, you don't want to mix that escrow with whatever retainer may be coming for the family law case. They should be completely separate. So here I have um, my different matters all listed. And for each one of them, you'll see I have this column at the far right, which is for trust funds. So I can see very easily what's available for that particular matter in trust. And then I can do any particular transaction. Down here, I have the option for trust, pay, uh, trust deposits, which is basically retainers coming in. And I can do trust payments, which are disbursements going out. So let's say I want to cut a check. And I'm not paying attention. I have a $1,000 check that I need to cut to a third party, and I'll save that, and then I realize, oh wait, I don't have those funds, and I didn't even realize it. I was just working quick, and I see that I would have overdrafted by 135, but because the system doesn't let me, I have not overdrafted. So this gives me a chance to say, let me reach out to my client, let me get those funds before I even risk overdrafting for my firm. So you could see how easily that could happen. I mean, it's kind of understandable that it can take place. However, that's not an excuse for an auditor. You can't just say, oops, I didn't realize I didn't have that money. So better choose tools that will completely prevent that altogether, and it just takes away that worry. I did mention too about applying um, retainers to invoices. That's one of the most primary trust activities that happens for anybody who manages retainers. So here, I have my unpaid balance in green because I have a retainer available. So when I go within this matter, I'm gonna go to my invoice area and I have a couple of invoices here, all right? So I see very clearly what I have that's owed 683 and I see I have trust funds and I know it's going to cover it but even if I had an $8,000 invoice the system's still not going to let me take 8,000 out of trust because I do not have it so let's take um, the part that I uh, have owed which is the 683 so I'm going to pay from an existing trust retainer and this is really just the benefit of having your trust in with your billing. And when I say trust with billing, I'm not talking about just retainer values. I'm talking about the full reconciliation, reporting, and everything. So I know that this trust retainer is accurate. I never question as to whether that number is what it should be because I'm reconciling in this system. I've already caught my mistakes. I've already rectified them. I know this number is correct. So I'm going to receive this payment. Actually, I'm going to apply it to these two. Receive. Now, what took place right there? I debited my trust, so you see my trust retainer is lower. I also reduced my unpaid balance to zero. My invoice has moved to paid. So you'll see I have a couple actually that we did. They have uh, a zero dollar balance. And even in the banking for this matter, I will have a check, see this 683, a check out of trust and a deposit into operating and that check is ready to be printed. So all of that crossover that I said falls through that gap, if you can have your trust and your billing together, the full workflows in one system, everything's gonna be managed for you. And compliant, like I said, not allowing overdrafts is very important. The last piece, um, just briefly, in terms of what reconciliation is, what it looks like, in case you're not using an actual software to complete that, um, I'm going to go to one of my trust banks here. You'll see all of my transactions listed on the screen. Let me go to all of them here. All right, I have all my transactions. I even have checks to print, which I can print from here. And I have a reconciliation tab. So the system will take all of my transactions that occurred this month or maybe uncleared from prior months. I have my deposits and payments over here, and I can either manually go through and compare to a bank statement, or automation can be used. Big time saver, especially if you're highly, highly transactional. Um, you can import your bank statement here, and it will auto-compare, 
or you can even use our bank feed function. Uh, bank feed is a way to feed in transactions from the bank. Now you're not using that to import, you're using that to match. So that way you can see what has cleared, if it matches your system, and you're kind of reconciling as you go. So by the end of the month, everything's already been addressed. So if reconciliation is taking a long, long time for you, um, a lot of uh, tools can automate that process as well. And in terms of reports, I showed all of those reports already, so I'm not going to go through what each one of those are. But I do want to show here um, in banking, this is where you have your reconciliation report and your three-way report. And then you have all of your trust reports here. Ledger balance, uh, ledger transactions, activities, statements. And don't be afraid to you know, reach out to your bar association or your ethics board or whoever is in charge of auditing and saying, can you give me a list of what's required in case of an audit? I know a lot of people are scared to reach out about that because they're worried that will flag them. Talk to somebody who's been audited. Your state bar is not going not gonna to report you for asking a question. Um, talk within the communities that you have other attorneys. Has anybody been audited? How was that experience? So you are prepared for that. I know way too many firms that when they get audited, they have to hire a forensic accountant. They put thousands and thousands of dollars into finding and cleaning up their books. And many times their office is shut down for a few weeks. So you don't want to be in that situation because that can ultimately close your firm depending on your cash flow situation. All right, so we're going to just wrap up right now. Um, a little summary of what we learned. We now understand trust accounting and the different components, the top 10 pitfalls, proper trust account records, and how different tools can help. Uh, some next steps, something to keep in mind if you're wondering, where should I go from here? Identify any of these issues in your practice. Think about the items we talked about and if you're experiencing any of those types of issues. Also, ensure proper reports are being filed and maintained. You don't want to you know, get audited one day and realize that whatever tool you're using can't even make the reports that are needed. And if you do identify any of these issues or you do feel like you're falling short in terms of compliance, research and implement a tool to ensure that proper compliance going forward. Like I said, technology really, really can help, but you want to make sure it's a trust accounting tool that understands what's needed in terms of compliance. So we're going to wrap up now. Um, this overall is, uh, in case you're curious about Coslex and what we do, uh, in addition to trust accounting, we do cover billing and business accounting and practice management as well in one web-based product. So if you're looking for another solution, feel free to let us know. But I do also want to uh, let everyone know about our upcoming uh, additional sessions to the webinar series. This is our first session, which again was trust accounting. On October 12th, we do have our second session, which is for credit card accounting. And October 26th, we have our third session, which is for business accounting. So feel free to register on our website. The link is there and it's right on our um, webinar section and you can register for any of these sessions that you choose. Thank you everyone for attending today's Cosmolex webinar series presentation. We hope that it was an educational experience for you and your, your law firm.